Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Beavis. I'm a consultant vascular surgeon in Southmead Hospital in Bristol. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce the fourth in these series of Aspire and BSET uh, webinars during COVID. And it's uh, my pleasure to have uh, with me tonight, as well as some people we've seen on the other webinars, uh, Raul Vallabanini, who's a consultant up in Liverpool. And uh, as panellists as well tonight, uh, Pete Holt is consultant in St George's and Celia Riga, who's consultant at Imperial as well. So what we'd like to do is, Raul's going to give a talk, and we're going to intersperse that with some questions as well. Please do feel free to put some questions on the Q&A part, and we'll try and answer those as we uh, go through. But I think without any further ado, Raul, would you like to uh, go forwards, please? Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, greetings to my fellow panellists and uh, all of you who have uh, joined on a fine afternoon. So acute aortic syndromes. Um, this is essentially a, a catch-all term um, to uh, describe a, a, a set of aortic uh, presentations. Um, typically, there are, are aortic distinctions, uh, penetrating aortic ulcer, and intramural hematoma. Uh, all of these uh, can be associated with periotic hematoma, uh, which is another uh, description for rupture. Uh, and sometimes it is obvious what underlying one of these three has caused periotic hematoma, and certainly sometimes you just see hematoma without uh, an obvious underlying cause, but these generally the four are what are described as acute aortic uh, syndromes. From an etiopathology point of view, um, we all know that aorta is a laminated structure with, uh, with uh, adventitia, intima, and the media in between. And atherosclerosis, as you know, is primarily a medial disease uh, uh, starting in the intima, and where a plaque uh, expanding within the wall of aorta can rupture, wherein the aortic lumen and the pressure forms a penetration into the plaque, uh, what is called a penetrating aortic ulcer. Uh, that can then propagate along a variable length of the aortic wall, causing an aortic dissection, uh, breaking in and out at multiple points, colloquially called as entry tears. Uh, Cross-sectionally, if there is thrombus, you will find it like so, whereas um, uh, long dissections uh, at least at the early phases, tend not to have much of a, a, a thrombus, um, giving on cross-section a large false lumen and a true lumen. The vast majority of the times, um, uh, you don't even need to check. It's the smaller one that is the true lumen and the larger one is the false lumen, although exceptions do occur. The third of these acute aortic syndromes, which is the intramural hematoma, is traditional teaching, and the pathology textbook states that it is when one of the vas avasorum uh, that is supplying the aortic wall, uh, when it ruptures intramurally, causing an intramural hematoma with a completely intact intima that is said to be intramural hematoma. This clearly definitely occurs, uh, because there are um, uh, autopsy confirmations of this. Um, as uh, CT scanners have become uh, very, you know, they, they, they are very high resolution now, um, it is increasingly possible to clearly identify these um, in, in, in patients as to what they are. Um, However, far from being discrete clinical entities, they tend to be, in clinical presentation, quite dynamic situations where um, a disease process can start as one of those conditions and progressing into the other. For example, uh, an, an, a penetrating aortic ulcer can uh, 
just give an extensive intramural hematoma or just propagate over a long length and cause uh, the traditional classic uh, acute aortic dissection. Um, a hematoma, also intramural hematoma, which started with the vasovasorum rupturing, can also become a, a classic dissection. And it is also believed that atypical presentations, for example, in intramural can rupture interluminally, uh, call, you know, looking like an aortic uh, ulcer, or a classic dissection can spontaneously thrombose completely, giving the appearance of an intramural hematoma. The general idea is to, 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 to mention that um, despite some uh, clearly documented and recorded um, uh, distinctions in the etiopathology and imaging findings, uh, they do occur um, as a, a spectrum of conditions um, with, with kind of uh, some shared features. Um, and the clinical picture can also be dynamic where a process that started as one condition can progress into another. Um, so that is the background to, to acute aortic dissections. Um, so um, how do these present? Clinically, typically, um, uh, the vast majority of them, uh, when they have a clinical feature, they, it's pain, uh, kind of tearing or, or stabbing kind of a pain, intrascapular in the back, uh, sometimes in the abdomen, sometimes in the front. Uh, frequently, uh, that can also be um, uh, confused with a, a myocardial infarction. A syncope also is a well-known presentation in a small number of people. Um, by causing uh, spinal cord ischemia, extensive acute aortic uh, um, syndromes can cause paraplegia um, or by involvement of the subclavian artery and, and vertebral territory uh, strokes as well. Um, hypertension, a commonly seen finding with the vast majority of, of patients uh, with all acute aortic syndromes uh, showing uh, difficult to manage uh, high blood pressure. Uh, paradoxically, it is uh, problems causing hypertension that can cause acute aortic syndromes as well, uh, as exemplified in cocaine use. Um, uh, peripheral vascular complications being the, for example, ischemic leg being the sole presentation of acute aortic syndromes is rather rare, but um, uh, leg ischemia frequently is a a, a, an accompanying feature of one of these symptoms, um, uh, which when present helpfully draws your attention um, uh, and uh, to, to the possibility of an acute aortic dissection. Um, in terms of incidence, um, uh, fortunately, the overall incidence of acute aortic syndromes, particularly the, the, the most voluminous of them, the acute type B dissections, has gone significantly down in the UK with um, a campaign uh, to identify and treat uh, hypertension early on, uh, which is very successfully done with the introduction of quality improvement frameworks for GPs about 20, 25 years ago. Um, uh, but certain parts of the United States are, have seen um, pretty much all of that benefit uh, lost uh, due to increasing use of cocaine use. And in certain urban areas, 90 to 95 percent of um, uh, acute type B dissections that are presenting are actually secondary to cocaine use. Um, uh, certainly where I work, um, cocaine-related uh, vascular and myocardial complications, but type B dissections are somewhat rare. I don't believe they are that common in UK anywhere. Um, so that is the kind of the, the initial um, uh, preamble to the uh, etiopathological aspects, just a, a bird's eye view in the clinical presentation of uh, acute aortic syndromes.
Paul, Paul, you're on, on mute. Right, it's, um, we find it's a quite a difficult presentation and there's been quite a push from Bristol because we've had a few missed cases over time in terms of awareness. How do you sort of go about trying to make sure that you pick up all these cases? Um, and it is something that, that we have always worried about. Um, in, in reality, we don't actually have a, a, a anything in place in the UK. But I, whenever I think about it, I do wonder. Um, uh, you remember there was a, a poster that was sent out uh, from BSET to, uh, to, to all accident and emergency departments saying, uh, think ruptured aortic aneurysm um, when, when there is an abdominal catastrophe. I wonder if something like that uh, might be of help, saying that uh, when you have sudden interscapular pain or chest pain, or when you are suspecting uh, myocardial infarction, but uh, if it is not a myocardial infarction, please do think of an acute aortic syndrome and, and have a low threshold to do uh, a contrast-enhanced CT scan perhaps would be of help, I, I wonder. I mean, we've, we've started doing a, an awful lot of very normal CT and JOA autograms as a result of our, of our sort of work, or what's gone on really from the emergency department down at the Royal Infirmary. Um, have you had anything similar in London at all, Peter or Celia? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of negative CT scans are done, but in the last 12 months, I sat on two SI panels for missed type A dissections. And undoubtedly, this is still not getting uh, the, the level of press that it should do. We've got the Think Aorta campaign, um, but I think that's not really hit the headlines in the way um, that maybe some of the, the other campaigns, such as Fast for Stroke, have done. Um, so it's somewhat of a disease that you have to wait for someone for the the light to go on, as it were, and someone to think to do a CTA aorta. And despite doing lots of negative CT scans, we're still missing them. Paul, can you hear me? We can. Um, hi, good evening. So I, I agree with, with Pete. I've also sat on a SI panel whereby, again, it was a clear case of missed um, acute aortic syndrome with essentially a uh, widened mediastinum on a chest x-ray. Uh, and even experienced clinicians in, in casualty can uh, find it challenging sometimes to think aorta, so to speak, first. And I think that's a really important point, actually, that, you know, you're going to have a certain number of missed ones along the way, but it is just about education and awareness, I think, for lots of these things. So, Rao, would you like to carry on? Yes, yeah. So, so um, I, I think that's a, that's a point uh, well, um, by, by the panel about uh, uh, thinking Iota. Um, so uh, I, I, would, I thought I would start with a, a, a simple case. Um, uh, so this is a 76-year-old lady who is actually rather frail, um, uh, doesn't walk much, uh, has multiple comorbidities, and um, she had upper GI symptoms and inability to swallow, for which she had a peg uh, tube for three months, and, and when she could not kind of tolerate that, uh, it was removed and she was managing oral fluids and, and, and oral intake. And she presented to her local hospital with, again, a, a pre-abdominal pain uh, for a few weeks and a worse pain in two weeks and dysphagia. Um, the one thing, despite everything, was that she did say that her symptoms were different to what uh, they, they have been. Uh, and, and also, she had a pre-abdominal tenderness. And they did uh, an upper GI endoscopy, which was uh, negative, and when an ultrasound was also negative, they did a CT scan. I suppose here on this occasion, what was helpful was somebody did think uh, aorta, 
and this is what it showed. This is the CT scan them, um, on, on, uh, at, at the peripheral hospital where it showed a very nice localized penetrating aortic ulcer. Um, uh, so um, kind of a tiny bit of uh, speckled calcium here and there, but, but not heavily calcified aorta and a very localized lesion uh, there and, and, and nothing to suspect uh, uh, peri um, uh, aortic hematoma or anything. At this stage, this lady um, uh, known to have, um, uh, as you know, um, uh, dysphagia. And helpfully, there was a CT scan from a couple of years before uh, on, on the PAC system, which showed that her aorta was normal in 2017. And, and we felt that perhaps this is, this is uh, acute and that, that might uh, have changed her dysphagia to the worse. Um, and she was transferred to the Royal Liverpool, to the HDU, um, after a couple of days of attempted blood pressure control. And there was um, a, a big debate within, within our unit whether or not this rather frail elderly lady should be just uh, kind of kept comfortable, uh, particularly in the presence of diagnostic dilemma, uh, or, or should be actively treated. Uh, she was reviewed by local gastro, and they felt that um, uh, uh, probably there is no gastrointestinal explanation for her uh, symptoms. And she then went and had this thoracic tube graft put in. Um, so you can see here a, a local kind of a divot um, of the, uh, uh, the, the, the penetrating ulcer. And uh, Simon Nikwe put in a, um, a, 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 a cook alpha uh, in there, uh, which actually helped her. Uh, her blood pressure was better controlled and, and, and uh, she was back to her usual self and she was discharged. Um, this angiogram kind of uh, shows a couple of things really, it shows the, the various pairs of, of lumbar arteries, which, which kind of uh, we need to keep in mind because uh, in extensive acute aortic syndromes, we lose a lot of these. Um, uh, if there's results in loss of perfusion of these, we get paraplegia. If the treatment results in loss of these, we get paraplegia. It's a difficult situation. Um, what's interesting here is um, after the, uh, uh, the, the, the device has been deployed in the immediate uh, uh, completion angiogram, there are still some anti-grade perfusion there, which I suspect will be lost uh, over the following uh, hours to days. Um, so this, I think, is a, a successful management of acute uh, aortic um, uh, a penetrating acute, uh, sorry, penetrating aortic ulcer, uh, presenting as an acute aortic syndrome, um, and and this is a, a relatively simple uh, uh, presentation and treatment. Um, quite frequently, the length of aortic coverage required is not very much. Um, uh, generally, I'm quite content with. Uh, putting uh, the smallest, you know, just 15 centimeter pieces, as long as I know that can be the entry point uh, and the stent graft uh, fabric is extending on, on both sides of, of the lesion. Um, there is actually another patient on the ward uh, uh, currently, as I speak, who would have either had uh, her, her treatment done today, um, or, or if not, it'll be done tomorrow. So, Rao, that just brings a couple of sort of questions to my mind. Um, so we've, we've been burnt before with those little ulcers that are just by the esophagus. And you, you put the stent in and it all looks like it's gone really well. And then they have a contrast swallow, which shows that actually it was a mycotic hole caused by uh, an esophageal fistula. Um, how, do you do anything to work up them beforehand, looking for mycotic sources or what's your sort of approach? Um, the, 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 uh, uh, we suspect mycotic when there is actually um, 
a, a, so in this patient, for example, uh, you get a feeling that there is aortic wall outside and, and, and this typically appears uh, um, as though this is within the, 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 the aortic wall. We fear mycotic aneurysm less frequently in those, but there are definitely some patients in whom very clearly uh, there's no calcification or anything outside, and the outline and the entire thing has got very typical features of um, uh, it being a false aneurysm. Um, so we do blood cultures, uh, but it is not normal for us to see uh, 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 any positive uh, uh, findings. There are definitely a couple of patients I remember very well where they never had any symptoms and it was actually both of them were incidental findings. Uh, and because we were scared to leave what was looking like a false aneurysm alone, we have put stent grafts. Um, it's thinking that if it is a mycotic aneurysm, still you can put a stent graft and fight another day and remove it if required during a definitive procedure is the thinking. Um, uh, but we never took them out. But we, it is something that we do worry about. Uh, remains a, a dilemma um, uh, because proving it one way or the other is not easy. So, Rao, would you have, um, if you had a higher suspicion of that being mycotic, and I don't know, it may, it may just be the slices that you've got up there, but it, it looks pretty unusual from my perspective. Would you maybe yeah. give them a couple of days of antibiotics before the procedure? And I accept the procedure is going to be the same, yeah, whether it's a dissection, penetrating ulcer, or, or, or mycotic. Would you delay so, it? So, so when we have a, 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 a very strong suspicion of mycotic aneurysms, um, uh, we take microbiology advice, and they have actually been advising us to give antibiotics for long periods of time. We have definitely got people with no microbiology, um, no pathogens identified, no microbes identified, but on clinical appearance of no gas or anything, just the morphology, the regular outline, have been on lifelong uh, um, antibiotics. But I mean, ahead of surgery, Rao, would you, would you give them, would you stage the surgery by? a few days rather than taking some emergent surgery? Would you give them two, three days of antibiotics to try and sterilize the field or? You uh, I mean, we may out? end up giving a two days or so of antibiotics, just waiting for an operation slot, but, but we haven't delayed procedures for that. It, it, the, the, the operation date is usually determined by the, the availability of a slot and the, and, and, and the, and the surgeon who is happy to do uh, uh, you know, to put the device in. So, do, you, do you think it's better if we give them a few days of antibiotics before putting, it makes sense. Are you saying that probably I the think, bioavailability may be better? Well, I think it's a difficult one. I, th I think if it looks very much, mycotic aneurysm is clearly a spectrum, isn't it? Between the initial seeding and that defect in the aortic wall out to a frank rupture or, or, or pseudoaneurysm. And I think it very much depends on the stability of the patient and the appearances. But I think if you can get antibiotics in for a couple of days and reduce the bacterial load, then it may be you reduce the chances of graft infection. Because I think very few people would now take a, a descending thoracic false aneurysm and take them for open surgery. Essentially, most people are going to stent them. And the question is whether you can reduce the risk of that stent getting infected and needing explant at a later date. And much like you, I've seen very, very few of these explanted, but I suspect there are people on lifelong antibiotics um, on the basis that they might get infected and whether we just reduce that risk if a patient's stable. It, 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 it makes perfect sense. Perhaps maybe we should actually deliberately try to give them antibiotics for, for, before we operate. Sorry, we're Can I just make a comment? Yes, please. So even the cardiothoracic surgeons, even in the context of a type A IMH, if there is 
if the patient is stable, but there are significant sort of changes in the lung fields and they have a concomitant pneumonia or any sign of sepsis, they would currently prefer to soak them, so to speak, in antibiotics for 24, 48 hours and then proceed, even in the context of an of a acute type A IMH. I have to say that, that, that that's my practice, Celia. I mean, it, it's obviously not um, not ubiquitous, but but I um, I would try and do that where possible. Yeah, I agree. Celia, I mean, I've been asked to put stents in before, as sort of a bridging thing. Have you had the same issues that we've had? You put the stent in as a bridging thing, at which point everyone goes lifelong antibiotics. I'm not doing the next bit. So. Um, it, 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 in our practice at Imperial, it, re it really depends on the patient and the overall clinical picture. It, it, over the last two years, for sure, those focal mycotic lesions, if the patient is young and fit, then we would take them uh, for an open repair via thoracal laparotomy, uh, usually on left heart bypass. Depending on the extent of the repair, Obviously, if there is a significant sepsis and these patients come in septic, then they don't do very well. Uh, but the ones that are young and fit and have had a period of stabilization do do well. Uh, the patients who are older with comorbidities, we have chosen this temporizing approach of stenting them to get them out of trouble, uh, soak them with antibiotics, usually for life, I would say that in a period of five to 10 years time, we do see uh, either fistulae or uh, disease progression and endo leaks, and we have to go back. By that stage, the patient is not really fit for an explant. In, in a way, we've treated the young and fit ones, you know, with open repair, and those that we've chosen the endovascular approach are really not very robust for a late open repair. Yeah, I think that sort of fits with lots of people's experience. Uh, Raoul, would you like yes. to carry on to your next bit, please? That yes, right? yeah. in our practice, uh, explantation has been relatively um, uh, mainly for fitness. Um, there we are. This is a 72-year-old man who presented with uh, high blood pressure and back pain. Um, and the CT showed a, 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 a somewhat subtle intramural hematoma coming all the way up to the arch there uh, and, and, and going uh, into the uh, descending thoracic segment. So this person, um, we were able to manage him medically uh, and, and the blood pressure was controlled and he didn't have any complications and, and, and he was uh, left alone. Um, so um, he, he, he did okay. So we don't always do um, uh, uh, stent them. This is another example of a, a type B intramural hematoma starting uh, quite high close to the left subclavian uh, artery. Um, uh, it, it, th this is quite a... a a, a, an angled uh, slice, as you can see at the bottom, there is probably a, a small uh, divot again. Uh, we still feel that this was uh, a, an intramural hematoma rather than a, a, a thrombosis of a primarily a type B dissection. So this person had continuing symptoms um, and, and the back pain could not be controlled. Uh, and so uh, they ended up getting a... Um, a stent graft, as you can see, um, covering the left subclavian artery, uh, and they did uh, fairly well. Um, and and uh, it, it, this person is now on, on um, uh, surveillance. So in terms of just to, uh, to, to, to kind of summarize treatment of uh, type B intramural hematoma, um, it's a lot less clear than some of the uh, uh, other syndromes, what do we do? And our experience with type B intramural hematomas has usually been uh, IOTA is quite extensively involved. And we also notice uh, in some patients the extent of aortic involvement and uh, pathology, the morphology evolving quite rapidly. 
Um, we do tend to do uh, CT scans, um, uh, repeat them at, at 48, 72 hours unless we have actually treated them. Um, there is this, uh, everyone describes that either the iota is unstable or the intima is unstable. Certainly, uh, disease progression is seen more often uh, than not. Um, with good quality uh, um, uh, is, is, uh, um, CT angiography, it is frequently possible to identify small tears in the intima as well. The trouble with them is they can require quite extensive coverage, uh, particularly if you see a, a, an intimal tear, and, and uh, we almost never aim to uh, do a, 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 an endovascular repair that does not cover the, the full extent of the intramural hematoma. Because of the extensive coverage required, there is a high risk of paraplegia, and therefore we like to do those with um, uh, motor evoked potential monitoring uh, in all of those. And this is where um, uh, you are uh, in, in the realms of uh, true multidisciplinary working, um, and you never regret discussing this with a, a good number of your colleagues um, and, and, and have the critical care on your side, and you need the neurophysiology uh, monitoring uh, and if required, um, uh, you know, a, a frank discussion with the patient about the, the, the risks of paraplegia. So um, I thought I would now go to aortic dissections. Brad, there's just a quick question from the floor um, mm -hmm. from one of your trainees. So. Um, have you got any tips for telling apart uh, intramural hematoma against intraluminal thrombus lining? Um, uh, well, uh, if there is a, a, a of lumen that is still perfused, it is very likely to be a dissection that had largely thrombosed. Intramural hematoma generally does not have any significant uh, opacifying lumen. Um, if you have the time and if you have a good uh, CT workstation, you can do virtual um, angioscopy on that and you may be able to identify, even without virtual angioscopy, by very careful observation, you will be able to identify if there are any entry tears. Um, so if the intima looks nice and smooth all over with absolutely no tear whatsoever, and there is no opacification of this um, uh, thrombus containing area at all, um, it will be a pure um, intramural hematoma. We do see them every now and then, um, though not very purely. Uh, in, 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 in my experience, um, you, you tend to give them a name based on the extent of opacifying uh, a false lumen. Um, we tend not to get too excited about the distinction because um, we can only do one thing for them, stent graft or no stent graft. <laughs> Is that a fair thing to say? I think so. <laughs> Well, can uh, conventional, conventional surgery is always a very good option and we always discuss them in MDT uh, before Celia tells me off. <laughs> I won't, I won't. But can I just make a comment? Because I think it is important um, in terms of those patients that are presenting with IMH that is extending across the arch. And I'm, I apologise in advance because I can't see the imaging. Uh, I can only hear you. But um, this, is a, this is a challenging group of patients. And unless you, you have a very good reason to do so, do not stent, do not put a stent in the descending aorta in the presence of an arch IMH, unless you have a very quick and robust backup by cardiothoracics. Um, in our experience, the ideal situation, the ideal uh, treatment I think for those patients who are fit is a frozen elephant trunk. And in those cases that we took someone to theater um, with a plan to do a frozen elephant trunk, that arch IMH 
in you know under direct vision had actually already formed a lumen so it had evolved into a, a frank type a dissection so beware of those patients with um, a, a retrograde imh they're very very challenging and high risk and they're definitely ones we manage jointly with our cardiac team as well it, it's it's a, a, a celia that that's that's a, a an absolutely valid point thank you very much uh, for, for pointing that out um what i should have made clear is, is that pretty much everything that I'm talking about is for uh, type B extent, pure, pure type B extent. Whether uh, any of these acute aortic syndromes started in the type A area or starts in the, in the left subclavian, but then goes centrally beyond, which is potentially described as a retrograde type A, but, but technically is just a type A, um, the dangers are are very high. Uh, surgical treatment plays a much bigger role than than endovascular. Uh, I 100% agree with you um, uh, that uh, a, a, any type A lesion needs to be treated with 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 a lot more care. Uh, and and one of the risks, of course, is that um, uh, of of managing a type B lesion is that it can be converted into type A as well. Yeah, yeah sure. absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Thanks, Brown, can I just ask you where, where your experience with this leaves you in terms of your thoughts on the underlying pathology? As you said, the, the textbooks would tell us that this is a bleed from the vasovasorum between the adventitia and media. Now, intuitively, that shouldn't respond to stent grafting. Uh, well, the, the, uh, uh, so the, the reason for stent grafting is because of this um, presumption that the aorta and the intima are unstable and that there is a risk that this intramural hematoma can rupture internally into the lumen, causing a, a, a turning into a dissection. And hence, um, if you are ever treating an intramural hematoma, we do really want to line the full extent of the intramural hematoma from, from top to bottom, rather than you know, treat some of it and leave some of it, in, in which case it won't work. The, the, the trouble there is the small number of patients in whom uh, what looks predominantly a type B dissection extends below the celiac axis, wherein the only thing you can put readily there is a petticoat, which does not serve the purpose that I was talking about earlier, which is to prevent a, 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 a rupture and conversion into a, a, a dissection. Um, uh, so um, other than worry and aim to cover the entire um, uh, intima that is associated with the entire aorta that is associated with the intramural hematoma, um, there is not a lot we, we, we can do. Raoul, can I, Rational can I... for treatment uh, uh, is, is to stop one of the complications. Yes, please, Celia. Just one quick question. So uh, your stent is deployed oversize or by how much? Very little. Uh, very little. And my, my question is, sometimes on the first post-operative CT, after you've stented the IMH, you do see small, you know, you do see contrast outside of your stent graft. Essentially, you see bleeding within the wall, which is often sort of branded an endo leak. Does it matter? Uh, well, the, again, this is one of those. Um, we treat that more or less similar as um, uh, persistent false lumen perfusion following an acute type B dissection, um, which is a source of concern, but in practical terms, um, not a lot one can do. Um, uh, so so we, we don't particularly necessarily treat it at that particular time, no. Thank you. In, in terms of thinking, the, the worry it causes is exactly the same as a, a persistent um, uh, uh, false lumen perfusion after type B, which is, which is something you'll, of course, see almost always. Yeah, and you hope they will remodel. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, going on to acute aortic um, 
uh, dissections. The um, essentially, um, you know, the uh, uh, the risk factors, uh, and then young people always consider. Uh, connective tissue disorder, whether or not they typically show Marfan features or not. Preeclampsia and pregnancy is said to be a, a risk factor, although I have never actually seen a patient and cocaine abuse is something we have, we have, we have heard. Type A dissection is managed in a simplistic way of me saying it. In certainly Liverpool, um, we have no experience of treating type A dissections or type A acute aortic syndromes in the luminally. Um, it's a rather dangerous condition uh, with very high risk of mortality very early on, mainly due to cardiac complications. So uh, I shall um, uh, move on from that. Um, and, and, and that, as I said, whether it is a primarily type A or something that could have started its life as type B but extended centrally, uh, uh, to, you know, proximal to the left semclavian is just as dangerous. Type B dissection, the primary management is medical, but then you do need to intervene if it is complicated. Um, there is something I would like to draw your attention to. Um, uh, uh, this is not, uh, th there is variation in the usage of the words, but, but what I'm about to describe is not controversial. Generally speaking, any dissection that uh, we can clinically be certain that has occurred within the last 24 hours is described as hyperacute. Uh, the first two weeks of a, a discernible uh, uh, history is said to be acute aortic dissection. And this acute period is very important because three quarters of the patients who ever die due to their aortic dissections do so within this period. And then comes the period that most people describe as subacute to be postacute sounds better. But in any case, this is from 15 days onwards. Textbook says 90 days, but there isn't a clear cut distinction. After 90 days, it becomes chronic. The reason why the period after 15 days is important to recognize is because the group of people who went into the instant trial. So similar findings from the IRAD registry, they both, in my personal view, which I'm, I'm prepared to be thrashed by you all, do support, uh, then not support, routine use of stent grafting in uncomplicated type B dissections in the post-acute phase. Uh, so, so it is important to recognize that. So in terms of management, I would say that in the hyperacute and acute phase, it's mainly medical management of blood pressure. It, in my personal experience, it is never worth trying to control it with one agent. You always need two agents, whether it is libitalol and GTN or sodium nitroprusside and, and libitalol or, or two. Much better if you can just source it out to a cardiologist or an intensivist. Absolute nightmare if you have to do it in your own uh, 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 surgically managed HDU. Um, it's no fun putting arterial lines yourself and, and, and looking after them. Um, uh, so so the, 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 the temporal classification is important in, in describing uh, acute aortic dissections. One of the main complications of type B aortic dissections is visceral malperfusion. It is described to be static or dynamic or a combination. Static is essentially where the dissection um, extends into the origins of the ostea of the aortic branches and um, uh, essentially the, the, the lumen is closed usually by, by thrombus um, or, or an immobile septum and that essentially is static, just blood is not getting easily now. Dynamic is where the pulse wave that is going through the double barrel lumen of this um, results in a, a flap-like obstruction of the ostium, which um, obliterates perfusion pressure. Uh, and, and, and don't forget, tissue perfusion, oxygen delivery, and tissue function, particularly globular apparatus, they are dependent upon a pressure gradient 
uh, more than uh, volume of the blood flow and they can cause effective ischemia or, or, or malfunction, malperfusion of the target uh, uh, organs. Sometimes you can have a combination of both in a few days. So visceral malperfusion is very important because that in itself is a bona fide indication. Malperfusion of gut can actually be difficult to identify in acute phases because you can't quite tell how much of the pain and the symptoms are actually due to the uh, aortic dissection and how much of it is due to the um, uh, uh, gut uh, uh, malperfusion. There isn't an easy and reliable uh, biochemical marker either. Um, it is quite possible that uh, we may fail to recognize that and, and it could be too late. Um, this is an example of a, a CT scan where, um, although to the naked eye, the distinction of the opacification between the true lumen and the false lumen of this uh, dissected aorta is difficult to see. You can see a stark difference how nicely the right kidney lights up, but the left doesn't. Uh, that's actually showing you the variance in the hemodynamics um, so the left kidney is relatively more profuse. Um, we uh, generally tend to medically manage them, uh, certainly the first 14 days anyway, and a failure of medical management would be a clear-cut indication for uh, uh, some kind of an intervention. Conventional surgery in selected patients has got its own advantages, uh, but uh, it has to be said that uh, it, it's, it's becoming a dying art. Um, increasing uh, proportion of acute uh, type B dissections that have earned themselves an indication for an operation are being treated by stent grafts either successfully or, or with partial success. Um, this is a quick example of a 60-year-old farmer from uh, Wales nearby. He presented with an acute type B dissection to uh, a Rexham, I think. Uh, he was managed at the coronary care there for six days, and they found that they could not control his blood pressure. He was then transferred to Liverpool, wherein we tried to control his blood pressure for a further two days, and we could not manage his blood pressure any better. Uh, indication that your blood pressure management is successful by the resolution of pain, uh, which rarely occurs before your mean arterial pressure falls to below 100. Uh, arterial line, uh, I would say, is absolutely mandatory in these people. By this time, this patient has started to become oliguric and his EGFR was falling which meant that we had to uh, intervene on him. Uh, the, the dissection went no central to the left subclavian ostium at the top, just as you see in, the, in this uh, 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 multiplanar reconstruction. You can see multiple entry tears and exit tears in this um, uh, dissection, which extends all the way to the infrarenal aorta. Uh, in the cross section, as I said, true lumen is usually the collapsed one and false lumen is usually the bigger one. In all these years, I have only ever seen once the other way around, which might be a dynamic picture. Here you can actually see the dissection extending into the left renal artery. Um, and we felt that we needed to treat him um, and we went by endovascular method uh, because of the extent uh, we chose to do both the CSF drain and use MEP. I find transesophageal echocardiogram absolutely yeah. essential in these. Uh, and and the, the main purpose of transesophageal echocardiography is to tell you whether your Ys are in the true lumen or the false lumen. They can come quite low uh, and, and, and show you up to the, uh, uh, the, the descending aorta. I do worry in the kind of complex dissections that you have just seen, whether the guide wires and catheters go in and out, flit between true and false lumens. Fortunately, uh, it hasn't happened to me, but it's a, 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 a matter of days before it does happen. You, you like to, I like to stay in the true lumen as much as possible, although I'm very much aware of some experts who deliberately have uh, a stent grafted the, the, the false lumen and maintained perfusion. 
this is coming as close to the left subclavian as possible. If required, I don't hesitate to cover the, the left subclavian artery. Um, beware of four vessel arches where the vertebral artery comes straight off the aorta. There is a higher risk of uh, uh, all kinds of complications, including limb ischemia. Um, here, because of the extent, um, uh, we have decided to put the petticoat, which is the bare stent extending across the vessel arteries. Um, it's always difficult to be certain whether or not you have expanded the, the true lumen enough and you have changed the hemodynamics enough with the proximal stent graft alone. Um, on a couple of occasions, I have cannulated uh, each, each renal vessel and did pressure traces before and after deploying the, the proximal stent to see if there is enough change in the waveform uh, uh, that, that I don't need to, to put uh, the petticoat in. But in this patient, we decided to put the bare stent across the, the whistle stent, whistle segment anyway. Uh, this patient gradually improved um, developed a pneumonia, but generally he survived and went home uh, and his high blood pressure did get uh, uh, controlled. So to, to, to speed up, just to give a few minutes for, for, for discussion, um, uh, the INSTEAD trial, which is a randomized controlled trial of a small number of patients um, who are at least 15 days after the uh, uh, start of a dissection uh, without any complications were randomized to scent graft versus uh, medical management. Uh, and instead trial showed that um, there is a better uh, a true lumen expansion and false lumen thrombosis in the stented group compared to the other group, but with similar survival in both of them. But because survival is probably arguably with the most important uh, 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 endpoint here, they did what's called a landmark trial. Essentially, uh, there are various different ways of doing it. What they have done was um, uh, uh, they only took the patients who survived at least two years and then compared them and then found that between two to five years, people who had stent grafts had much better survival than those who did not. Uh, they also reported that when they did uh, uh, a landmark analysis with uh, 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 rejigging the landmark to why survival benefit is shown. Now, there, are, there is a degree of statistical trickery there, and it is not the, the biggest number of patients in there. But generally speaking, the putative mechanism of true lumen expansion and false lumen thrombosis, which is seen broadly from other studies as well. And the general tendency is that I'm one of those people who generally believe that perhaps uh, a, a stenting uncomplicated type B dissections in the post-acute phase might give them better survival than just medically managing them. Uh, but by no means it is a universally held view and it can be argued to be a controversial view. What that has changed my practice is I have now a lower threshold uh, to, to stent them rather than uh, uh, just go for stenting everybody. To summarize, um, thoracic endovascular repair in, in acute aortic syndromes um, uh, uh, is associated with a number of issues. Pay attention to the proximal landing zone. It can be quite difficult in angled arches and left subclavian artery may require coverage. Cover it without worrying if required. This is a point uh, Celia uh, made uh, absolutely appropriately. Do not oversize excessively for the fear of converting a type B dissection into a retrograde type A. Length of coverage can be difficult to ascertain. Uh, the provisional extension to induce complete attachment, which is essentially putting a petticoat, which is a, a, a bare stent into the vessel segment, uh, uh, can be utilized. Uh, dist determining the distal landing zone is always difficult. Be ready to stent the branches. Uh, operation conventional surgery is always a... Um, uh, an option. Uh, 
um, pay attention to iliac axis because some of these people can be young. Um, uh, stroke and paraplegia risk is substantial and there is a retrograde type A dissection. What I find is that uh, 15 years as a consultant, I do not think that I have reached the peak of my learning curve or, or the plateau of my learning curve of managing um, type B dissections or um, uh, acute aortic syndromes. I believe this is one of the most difficult ones where genuinely a multidisciplinary team working and having a critical mass of people from different um, uh, 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 thought process and different uh, um, uh, surgical uh, uh, and, and interventional basis do help the team. Um, and I think I'll stop there and take any questions, Paul. Right. Thank you very much, Rao. Now, you have beautifully touched on the thing that most of us find quite difficult um, around a lot of these things. And your case number three, I think, highlights that. So you've got a patient who's sitting in another hospital for a number of days. Yeah. How do you decide who comes to the Royal Liverpool? You know, is it just resource-based? Are there physiological things that make you transfer them? Because I think that's what we all find difficult. Who do we move and when do we move them? Right. The reality is in Liverpool, um, the, the Liverpool Heart and Chester and, and uh, IOTIC team and the Royal Liverpool IOTIC team, we work together as one team, but across two sides. We've been talking for the last 15 years, ongoing discussions but by the time I got appointed to create a type uh, B uh, dissection service, which we still haven't got. So essentially, uh, either the Liverpool uh, team or the team... Um, Liverpool Heart in Chest take a telephone call from a referring hospital and then we make telephone con uh, uh, calls with each other, discuss the images on the telephone and then essentially take the patient to wherever there is a bed. If it looks that conventional surgery is a significant option, which is becoming vanishingly rare these days, they always go to Liverpool Heart and Chest. Uh, if not, they come to the Royal Liverpool. But these days, with everybody being treated, uh, the majority being treated endoluminally with hybrid theatres in both the places, uh, we just take them where we can, where we have a bed. Okay, Celia, what do you, who do you transfer in, and what do you see as a failure of medical management? Um. So I think that's probably the most important question for trainees is whenever they take a call uh, regarding an acute aortic syndrome, the first question that they should be thinking about is, is this patient in a place of safety? And is this patient in a place of safety right now? Because within four, six hours, however long it takes you to liaise with radiology, liaise with cardiothoracics, liaise with your boss, uh, potentially uh, it can have devastating complications for that patient. So um, the, the, um, we would take anybody with a strong uh, clinical presentation of dissection or confirmed radiological findings. And I wouldn't even, you know, wait for them to get an art line or be started on labetal unless they're in a place where they know what they're doing. So I would say blue light and they need to come across. As soon as they arrive in recess, they need at the bare minimum an arterial line and to start on labetal uh, And then a gas straight away to know what the lactate is uh, and then closely monitor the, the response. The other, the other thing that I'm going to just briefly mention, because we, we sort of hadn't experienced that until uh, we lost our vascular HDU, is that if you choose to, to manage one of these patients with medical management, they need very strict criteria in terms of um, uh, inotropes and blood pressure parameters. Remember that most of these patients will be discharged on four, if not five, antihypertensive agents. And what we have seen when they go on the GICU is that they take the arterial line out because they need to be stepped down sooner 
and they get boluses of, of uh, antihypertensive medication. That's not good enough for dissections because it's the sudden surge in blood pressure that will lead to sudden dilatation. So these patients will need, if you choose to manage them medically, they need at least three, four days of invasive blood pressure monitoring with serial CTs. I'm not sure what anybody else's view is on that, but I think it's really important because we see those late dilators in the early uh, period within the first week of presentation where an uncomplicated dissection becomes complicated. And do you have a sort of cut-off for the, like, the number of antihypertensive agents? So you know, the pain's all settled, the blood pressure's still really difficult to manage, they're on six agents. Is that an indication to go in and do something? I think it is, yes. It, it, it is in, in, in our books too. I mean, the, the, what uh, Celia just described is, is absolutely the, the ideal way of managing them. And the difficulty practically can be actually getting back to the availability of bed is a difficult one. To, to, to accept the patients so readily. But, but the management principles you said are absolutely the, the, the correct ones, including the, the art line. Uh, both uh, uh, coronary care and intensive care, uh, uh, the anesthetists and the cardiologists do like to remove arterial lines sooner than, than it is ideal for these patients, that, 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 that I agree. Uh, difficult to manage um, uh, uh, hypertension uh, I would consider is an indication for uh, uh, for, for stent graft management, and I don't quite know whether it is just the um, uh, the, the, the renal malperfusion, but generally uh, 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 satisfactorily stent grafting them does reduce their blood pressure. It helps the medical management. And Pete, so you've obviously been quite affected by everything that's been going on, has that affected how you've managed any of these patients in recent times or the patients you've seen presenting? Uh, well, the, the, the most marked thing is they just haven't been presenting at all. So from our normal rate of, of presentation for, for acute type Bs, um, yeah, we, we, we've had a run in the last couple of weeks, but for, um, yeah, for the best part of two months, we, we saw really very few. So I'm not quite sure what's, what's been happening to them. Um, probably the same as everything else, just not presenting to hospital or presenting much later. But um, th there's been quite a big gap of a few months, a couple of months where, where there's been very little. And one thing I would say is that we're perhaps more at the same end as Imperial, that we have a, an always accept mentality for these. And I think that it's important to get the patients into, a, into an environment that's very familiar with managing acute type Bs, they are difficult. And perhaps in some of the, the smaller DGHs, they might be tend to be monitored um, by cardiology. And they have a very different treatment algorithm. And I think there's a lot of unmet need out in the community or out in the smaller hospitals of patients who would potentially benefit from treatment, who then either don't get surveillance um, or present with acute problems. And just a question that's come off the question and answer bit, just for out of interest. What do you do if someone's got a contrast allergy for these different steroids and given contrast? <laughs> well, um, so, Raoul, you talked about you know cover the left subclavian with impunity. As a, I did two in a row, and one ended up with arm ischemia and one with spinal cord uh, symptoms that then both responded to having a secondary carotid subclavian bypass. Is that always your policy to cover with impunity and then deal with afterwards? Uh, yes. Um, so if, with elective operations, um, we, we have done um, uh, uh, translocation of the, of the subclavian artery, which I find kind of quite scary. Um, uh, and, and after doing uh, three or four some time ago, uh, if required, I just do a, a carotid subclavian bypass rather than translocation for the fear of losing control of the stump from the top. Um, uh, but but in, in emergency situations, I always cover both in you know, trauma situations like a, a blunt aortic injury or these. 
fortunately, uh, 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 I myself never had ischemic problems. However, there is a patient who had a, 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 an aortoesophageal fistula who actually unfortunately died, who had a left subclavian covered last week, who had a terribly ischemic arm. And our interpretation of what has happened there was that he probably had some anti-grade blood flow still through the subclavian, but sluggish, formed thrombus in the stump, which embolized into the forearm and caused ischemia. And I think left subclavian artery coverage is extremely well tolerated. You've got very good anastomosis around the scapula. Uh, and, and, and vertebral artery, if it's a normal vertebral artery takeoff, actually gives you know, very good collaterals. So I don't think hemodynamically just obstructing the left subclavian alone gives a troublesome uh, arm-threatening ischemia frequently. They may get arm you know, exercise intolerance. I, I think um, I, I'd second that, Rao. In an acute situation like this, the, the evidence really for posterior circulation, stroke, and so on around left subclavian coverage is very much in the aneurysm group and far less in these acute aortic syndromes. And I, again, would, would if necessary, go from the, the left carotid down and then re revascularize if necessary. Yeah, I agree. They rarely get any arm symptoms they may claudicate but then that tends to get better um the main indication to do a carotid subclavian would be actually stroke prevention but uh, yeah C certainly ruined my colleague's boxing day when the arm was properly ischemic um so what do you all do for your sort of routine surveillance when the patients present to you present to your hospital do you have a pretty standard separation of ct scans to follow these people through do you want to start, Celia? Um, we, yes, we normally, we usually say repeat the CT in 48 hours. Um, and uh, we try to avoid treatment by irradiation. And once you have the third CT scan that shows new pleural effusions, sort of dirty aorta or frank uh, expansion, then y you have to bite the bullet and treat them. Uh, and it's all a balance of risk, depending on the extent, what vessels you're going to have to cover, etc. But um, usually it's 48 hours. In Liverpool, uh, pretty much all of my colleagues would like an early uh, um, a CT scan, um, you know, flexibly, uh, but definitely before discharge. Um, with the exception of me, who uh, avoid um, a CT scan if the clinical uh, course is satisfactory, um, and I do a one-month CT and then annual one, um, it, it never looks pretty. With, you know, uh, immediate CT scan. It's very rare, you know, it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, perfect in every sense. Um, and if, I would like to be guided by, by clinical picture, uh, but, but that is not, not the usual practice. Most people like an early CT. I'd say that I'd do one in the first 24 to 48 hours, depending on the clinical picture, and then usually one at about five days. Um, and if they don't need treating at that point, then one at about six weeks, and then on to a standard longer-term surveillance. But of course, you have to be uh, responsive to any changes in the clinical situation, which can happen not infrequently, particularly around the blood pressure and ongoing pain. Um, Once you've treated them, I think you also need to have a very defined surveillance program because these people often come back with a bit of gripey chest pain again and again and again. And the risk is you, you just CT them repeatedly when you know the situation is going to be stable. And that takes a bit of kind of working out as to what are sinister symptoms after a stent and what aren't. Uh, 
Yes, I mean, in terms of uh, penetrating aortic ulcers and intramural hematomas, some people, fortunately, you may be able to discontinue or at least rarify the, the surveillance intervals. But in type B dissections, almost always we leave some problem behind, uh, particularly in the infrarenal segments, where there is a, a, a risk of dilatation, formation of complex aneurysm disease, etc. So those are the people who definitely require uh, a, a, you know, a structured surveillance for the rest of their life. The only thing to mention here is for those patients that have been treated successfully treated and you have good evidence of um, aortic remodeling, you can move on to MR surveillance. And, and we would do that as, as soon as possible, actually, especially for the younger patients. Yeah, we certainly do that as well. Um, so we've gone through lots of stuff. I think we've got time for just one more question and then I think everyone will want to uh, run away. But uh, just one last question from Patrick. Um, so looking to the future, is endovascular therapy for type A going to come online or should we leave it with the cardiac surgeons for now? What do you think? Uh, well, the, 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 the technical uh, um, uh, aspects for, 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 for that, they, they're, they're obviously quite complex. I think we need to see um, a, an endobenthal uh, successfully done on an elective patient uh, on a non-acute dissection patient. Uh, that as a technique, once that is perfected, that is the time to start thinking about uh, 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 treating acute aortic syndromes by endoluminal. Uh, uh, until then, um, I'm afraid we need to leave that uh, for, for surgeons. That's my personal view. I say it's bound to come. Um, having treated a type A dissection endovascularly, it went very well. Uh, you know, it's very, very selected cases. There's about you know, 20 in the literature, but um, it will come. Of course it will come. It, it may, may require treatment with a stent hanging off a TAVI or, or something similar to that, but um, it, it'll happen. I yeah. think from a sort of hemodynamic and mechanical perspective, the arch currently is very, very hostile, very, very unfavorable for the currently available devices. And uh, it needs a definitive repair, which is why I think the frozen elephant trunk is, is the best of both worlds for, for the time being. Um, of course, it's going to be minimally invasive in the future, but it may need a significant modification of what we currently call, you know, a stent graft or a tube graft in terms of the engineering solutions. Brilliant. So I think it's sort of drawing to time that uh, we've come to a close. I'd like to say thank you very much uh, to the panellists and to Ralph for his talk. And we've covered some of uh, dissection and acute aortic syndrome but I think it's it's quite clear that uh, you know you can spend a lot of time discussing it and I'm not sure there's ever a perfect answer for some of these patients and I think you have to all work together pretty closely to manage these difficult patients uh, uh, you know in the best way possible uh, so hopefully everyone's enjoyed that and we hope to see you back next Monday thank you very much right. thank you Paul